Welcome to All Write in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian, Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair, and me, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker. today is Rosemary Nixon. Rosemary Nixon is a short story writer, novelist, editor, and creative writing teacher. She has served as the writer in residence at the University of Windsor in 2011, and recently she returned as writer in residence in January and February of 2022. Nixon's first collection of short stories, Mostly Country, was shortlisted for the Howard O'Hagan Award. She won it with her second collection, The Cock's Egg. Her novel, Kalila, was shortlisted for the George Bounier Award for Fiction. Her most recent work of fiction, Are You Ready to Be Lucky?, was nominated for two international awards, the Frank O'Connor International Short Fiction Collection Award and the Four Words Indie Fab Award. During her latest residency, Nixon was available to the campus and Windsor communities for one-on-one creative writing consultations. Welcome, Rosemary Nixon. Thank you so much for having me. This was your second time as a writer in residence at the University of Windsor, about a decade apart. What did you like best about each residency and what was most challenging? Well, I loved both residencies. When I came in uh, 2010, 11, I guess it was, um, I was just blown away by the, the kindness and the interest and the generosity of the of the professors in the English department of the university as a whole, um, members of the community was such a warm place to be. Um, And I would walk all all the way from Wyandotte for an hour and 15 minutes to get to the university because I just loved the the ambiance. Um, It was also the the 2010-11 was a real um, special time because my book Kalila was about to come out and different uh, professors in the English department too actually um, edited the final book for me, the the final draft. Um, Alistair McLeod was at the university then too and became a wonderful friend and uh, that that was a highlight. But just, you know, meeting the people, talking about discussing the writing process with students, et cetera, was great. Um, There was nothing (laughs) very challenging about 2010, um, 11. This time there was a lot challenging because it was the pandemic. Um, I was supposed to start on a day when they decided university wouldn't start for another another, um, week. I was supposed to be there in person and ended up being virtual. But again, people just stepped to it and were helpful. And um, it, it just showed to me the, the resilience and the, the hospitality of you know, the people of Windsor that I connected with. Yeah, and, and we love Al- Alistair McLeod too. I mean, he was yes. just such a force around here and, and in writing as well. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what has, uh, and we lost Alistair sadly, but uh, so what has changed in the world of writing in that span of time, your Windsor years, let's call them. And how did that impact your interaction with the students, do you think? You know, I'm, I'm seeing more writers of color, which is great to see. Other than that, that, you know, people are still trying to write a good story, trying to defamiliarize, make it new, see through new eyes. I, I talk to them about these things when I, I, I always meet for a one-on-one hour uh, and talk with their work after I've uh, critiqued it and, and um, edited it. And I, I think, I think, I think on the whole, I find the writers becoming more aware of language and the power of language. And I certainly highlight that whenever I'm working with someone. But other than that, you know, writing's hard. Um, 
a story still a story and some some newer writers are astonished at you can't just tell a story there's so many problems people run into so I don't know if another writer would agree with me but I I don't think as much has changed people I mean new new topics can come up because of what's happening in the world but it's still how do I make this powerful how do I open up a door and have the reader step into my story and forget where they where where he or she really is yeah it's it's uh it's difficult and exciting and it seems to be that way no matter what year it is that I work with students your novel Kalila dealt with a couple that was going through the heart-wrenching experience of dealing with a critically ill child and your novel and short stories are you ready to be lucky had a cast of characters that was really down on their luck in terms of love and marriage but they kept trying anyway um what is it about that kind of heartbreak and that kind of relationship to pain i guess that uh draws you to those characters and story well first of all a story about nice people with nothing happening to them <laughs> Sadly, is not a story. So I forget it was that Anne Lamott or some writer said we have to be willing to, you know, put our characters in the car and drive into the, drive across the ice and let the, the car fall through and, and then deal with it. So I think the very nature of story is that heartbreak or the the difficulties, the complications, how people deal with difficulty, what 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 it reveals about one character versus another. Um, I don't I don't think that way when I'm when I'm writing. It sort of comes, I, I've 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 said before, instead of writing coming out of my head, I know this will sound nutty, it comes out of my hand, like I'll write a first sentence. I don't know what I'm doing or where I'm going, and I'll write a first sentence, and it kind of drags the second sentence after it and I I discover what my story is as I'm going but I mean you're right I I certainly deal with conflict or difficulty whether it's internal I I I guess that's life you know I don't know anyone who hasn't gone through some difficulty or trauma and I think um that's where the heart of of story is maybe that's too simple an answer but N not at all I, I i am curious though you talk about how you start a story so you don't start out with an idea necessarily in mind you just it's sort of well, a mystical I, process i can i can start with like kalila i knew i was going to write about the parents with the baby but other than that i didn't know um with are you ready to be lucky i just had a contractor and uh i was i was getting a house fixed and he would say the funniest things and i was uh, getting my master's at ubc and i just suddenly i i had a story due and i missed i missed when the deadline was i i missed knowing when the deadline was and it was like oh my god i have to get this story in and I, I don't know what to write about and I haven't. And I thought of some of this man's funny lines and I got them down and the whole story evolved from, from that. So I didn't know when I sat down what I was going to do. Um, it's, it's a process of discovery for me. I actually worry <laughs> when people say they outline their novels and you know they're gonna put this in chapter one and this in chapter two. Because I think, that, I mean, it's a personal opinion, it's not a rule of writing, but I think people miss so much if they know what they're going to do and say. I, I, I believe you have to listen to your characters, recognize who they are, and they'll, they'll start telling you, no, that's not me. That's not what I do, let's try this. And I want it to always be a surprise because I edit, what feels like 24 hours a day sometimes. Um, when I come across a story that surprises me, that I uh, 
I just didn't know that was going to happen or, oh my gosh, what a crazy person this is becoming. I'm delighted. It's just so great to want to turn the page, those little hooks and escalations. So instead of knowing where I'm going, I will look for those little hooks and exclamations that just hook you, make, make, make the reader want to turn the page. What is your approach to creating and developing a character? I know they have to be complex, but they have to be consistent before. I worked with a a few people and now I'm doing a writer in residency here in Calgary and a few more popped up where they aren't consistent in the first place. They, They seem to have one character trait, but then on the next page, they have the opposite character trait. And you, you don't, the reader doesn't believe that. The reader will walk away, feel, feel that the writer isn't in charge. I, I watch life a lot. There are so many wacky things that happen out there. Um, if I hear a line of conversation that's strange, or I hear about a situation, I will just jot down the idea and see where it goes. What I at least aim for is consistency in a character, but moving into complexity and also individuality. You want, I want a character like no other. I'm, I'm writing on paper, it's cliche a lot. And it's not only that you don't want to use a cliche because everybody is so overused, but Cliches don't create unique people. If they roll their eyes, clench their teeth, you know, um, you can, you, I, if I say roll your, you would know it was eyes. Um, so I, I really work myself and work with students and, and those I edit to defamiliarize, to see with new eyes and make this person unique in the world. When they're frustrated, what do they do? Show me they're frustrated. Don't tell me they're frustrated. And that starts building. It's also important with characterization to realize how, how, what a difference language makes. Just having the character, well, it, I mean, this is a very simple example. If I say, uh, Melinda, pop down the steps in her strawberry dress, you get a picture of this little girl. If I say, Holga marched down the stairs in her blood red dress, you get a very different kind of character. I said exactly the same thing. So paying attention to the texture, I'm actually doing a workshop here in Calgary shortly, an all day workshop on the texture of language, because we, it's like a pebble dropped into a creek. It makes ripples of meaning when you pay attention to the difference between um, strawberry, which has nice connotations, nice sound, and the blood red. They, they just start creating a character. The, the language starts creating a character for you if you pay attention to them. Your reviewers have, have certainly often remarked about the, the beauty of your prose and complementing the imagery. Um, and so and that's one thing that, that I think you, you've, you've talked about there. Um, with Are You Ready to Be Lucky, did that begin as a short story that grew? Or did you always plan it to be a novel told in a series of linked short stories? Well, it's, it's funny. I thought it was short stories. And I, I didn't even uh, send the book out for publication. I was actually leaving for a conference in Portugal in two days when I got a call from Freehand Press. And they said, we hear you have a short story, uh, or we hear you have a book ready. Get, we, it turns out we have an opening. Would you send it to us and let us see? And I said, you know, I can't because I've just finished up the master's program and I'm heading to Portugal for this two week conference. And uh, I haven't done the final edits yet. I just got the final edits. And they said, we don't care, Um, send it, send it anyway. And so I went to Portugal and the last day of the two week conference, I woke up to an email 
that said, we love your book, we'll take it, uh, which was great. So I got home, they, they said they, you know, they thought the language was fantastic, et cetera. So you think you've got this perfect book. And when I started working with my editor, she said, yeah, I don't see this as a short story collection. I think it's kind of a loose novel that she said really a hybrid. So what I want you to do is read the whole book over, add one more story about this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this, this isn't even the genre that I thought it was. Um, but I think she was right. And I think the story that I wrote last was really important to tie the collection better together. So um, some reviewers called it a hybrid, some called it a short story collection, some <laughs> called it a novel. And uh, I, I think it's important to, it, to, to not, pardon my grammar here, to not decide what it has to be, but let it, come out of you and and uh, discover what what it is or let someone else discover if you can see yourself was it hard to keep all the main characters on track to keep track of all of that in this different format no the, because nothing except for writing that extra story not, not a lot changed it was still the way it was. It's just the way it was seemed to her to be more than a collection, more than an interconnected collection. Yeah. You've touched on the warm and happy environment at the University of Windsor and how, how you really liked it there. And also your relationships that were ongoing with Alistair McLeod and Tom Dilworth. What kinds of things did you guys like to talk about as friends and writers? And how did they help you with your writing? Well, you know, Tom and Alistair were very good friends and <laughs> they started um, showing up in my office. We, we tended to get there before a lot of the profs. I just would like to start my day, you know, quietly before the students got in and Alistair would start coming. I'd hear him coming down the hall and he'd shout, is that famous writer in her office? <laughs> Which was a joke because he's incredibly famous and I wasn't. Um, and the, he'd just pop in and talk every day. He'd talk, he'd, he'd talk about um, his books in different countries. I remember like uh, being published in different countries and problems that he ran into. One was, uh, it was the colors of a flag the country was fighting or something, you know, could, could be anything. Or he'd walk in, I'll get this wrong, I do every time. Why, why, why did six, why was six afraid of, why was seven afraid of eight? No, six afraid of eight because somebody ate nine. <laughs> he, would, he would love the silliest jokes. And he'd come in and, you know, to tell jokes. Um, he told me that his first, very first writing was poetry and that he would uh, recite it to his horse when he uh, took the milk wagon around the, the city and, and dropped off milk. Um, we'd talk about life, our kids, um, you know, the writing process, all, all sorts of things. Yeah. I, you know, I'm trying to think what was an example of a profound writing conversation we had. And of course, I can't think of it offhand, but we did have those two. What a privilege to collaborate with folks like that. And what a privilege it was for them to collaborate with you as well. Well, it certainly was me for them. As an author and a teacher, what is your best advice for budding writers today? Writing is hard work. I hate writing. I love rewriting. A person has to decide if they want to write or if they want to be a writer. And I come across a number of people who don't really care about writing. How can I get published? I, you know, I want to be, I want to be a writer. And it, it, you just have to do the work. You, you have. I would say to a new writer, you must first understand the power of language. Why did Salman Rushdie have a fat one in his head? Why are there people in prisons around the world for their writing? Because 
writing is powerful. It's, it changes lives. And, and it, if they don't pay attention to how they're, they're saying what they're saying, it, it's, not going to, it's not going to be the best it can be. It's, it's not going to move people. It just reminds me, I hope this is not topic, but I listened years ago to a, a CBC radio. Eleanor Wachtel was interviewing Carolyn Forche, who had uh, just put together a book of poetry in which she had poets around the world who were incarcerated for their, you know, their beliefs, their, their writing. And she, she'd called it Against Forgetting. And I was driving in my car and listening. And Elner Wachtel said, I, I, I need to ask you a question, though. She said, um, I, ju I just i am wondering why, seeing as they're all in prison in different countries for, you know, for what they've written, why did you not ask them each to write a, a, po a poem about prison or their prison experience? And the radio went silent. Like, it, I th you know how your station can suddenly cut out. I actually thought that it happened. And I guess Carolyn Forche was sitting there thinking. And she said, but I didn't have to. She said, you could tell the poet had been in prison by the way the snow fell in the poem. And I thought, oh my gosh, what a beautiful way to say it. And I, I, I really work with each student to help them understand that language is powerful. And language is to be respected. You know, respect what it can do. If you can't even bother to pay attention to what it can do, why on earth do you even want to write? So that, that's very important to me, the, the, the power of writing, defamiliarizing, making things new again. Um, Eudora Welty said, Every, everything, every topic's already been written. You can't come up with a new topic. It's been done. And it's basically true, but she said only the vision can be new. And when I, when I think of the word revision, because we have to keep rewriting during revision, it's actually made up of re-vision. And, and in order to have a vision for the world, how it is, where it's going, you, you need to understand how you need to choose the powerful words and phrases. You know, the word thick sounds thick. You can have a harsh guttural Anglo-Saxon word like, of course I won't be able to think of one and there are a million, catapult. Or you can have attention, which comes from attention. And the sound is so different. I, I do an exercise where, uh, with my students, I'm always, we do a lot of exercises, one pagers, but I'll write on the, on the whatever I'm writing on. Um, Edgar got in the boat and gripped the seat, sweating like an ox. He hated the sea. And I'll say to them, is Edgar 250 pounds or 125? Is he... Uh, a professor or does he do blue collar work? Is he teaching anger management or taking anger management? And they will all have the same answer. Well, how nutty, it doesn't even come near to talking about that. Then I'll give them, Julius entered the vessel and entered the vessel, I have to remember this, and embraced the cushions perspiring profusely. He detested the ocean. And he's 125 pounds. He teaches anger management. He doesn't take it, whereas the other guy takes it. And it's all the difference between Edgar and Julius, between gripped and embraced. So, you know, you're telling a story, even if you don't know you're telling a story, by the sounds of your language. So you might as well <laughs> figure out what you're doing and make use of our amazing language. And so what language are you using now? What's your latest project? What are you writing now? Unfortunately, I'm editing everybody else <laughs> instead of getting very much writing done at all. I, I got the idea in my head that I'd like to, I don't, I don't want to write a typical crime novel at all. And I couldn't because I don't have the 
you know, I don't have the background, but I would like a murder or what appears to be a murder in a, in a small town community, in a religious community. Um, I was brought up religiously in a small old Mennonite or Swiss Mennonite community in Saskatchewan. And, um, you know, people were very, on the whole, very kind and loving and um, respectful. But there, there was a family or two who weren't treated as well. And as an adult, that really, it, I, I keep coming back to that thought. Um, and why was that? And what would happen if? So I found an RCMP officer who would talked to me here in Calgary. And, you know, we had some wonderful long talks about, ended up getting off topic and talking about life as well. And I thought, I'd like, I'd like him to be involved somehow with this community. And I, you know, I have lots of scenes written, et cetera. But I, I just, I work so hard with editing everybody else and doing these writer in residencies, which I, I love, that I'm not as far along as I'd like. But I, I, I wanted to try something different. Kalila and Are You Ready to Be Lucky are so different from each other. And in fact, the Cox said the book before takes place in the Congo. It was Zaire at the time I wrote it. So that book's very different. The, my very first book was an interconnected collection that deals with uh, that, that small town. And I'm not quite sure why, but I, in a very different way, I've sort of come around to think maybe there's more to explore there. Thank What's your you. ideal way of carving out writing time? Do you like to go on retreat or do you wait for the vacations or? I, honestly, I'd like to ask how uh, someone how I could carve it out. I'm terrible at carving it out. I've done numerous retreats. The Banff Center is near here, you know, and that, that's great, a great place to write. I, I so like having my books and papers around me when I write. I keep thinking of things and popping up and looking at them that I'm less likely to want to do a retreat than, than I used to be. I, I decided, I, I hope I do this. After I finish this writer in residency, the end of um, May, I'm also always editing privately people's novels, et cetera. So, I don't get much sleep. And I just thought, I've never done this. Like in, I don't know when I ever took a month off. I can't remember ever doing it really. And I'd like to take a couple months off this summer and just see if I can find these, you know, sit down and, and write because it's, 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 become, it's my fault, but it's becoming too much when I can't even get to my writing. You know, I have, I know people who we put out books the same year and a, another writer will have had two books since then. And I've just, I'm always teaching, editing and, and I love doing it. And I love, I, I've had so many students who are so great or get so good at writing and they'll come in really nervous or they'll say to me after the first class, Rosemary, I'm in the wrong class. I'm not, I'm not strong enough for this class. And I'll say, yes, you are, if you want to be. I don't care where you start. I care where you end in the class. So I'm very passionate about writing and, and it's hard for, I mean, about um, teaching, writing too, I guess. And it's hard for me to say no, but I think I have to put the oxygen mask on my own face <laughs> for a bit, yeah. That's a really common struggle for writers. So yeah, we totally understand. So would you like to read a bit of your work for our audience? Sure. I decided I'm going to read a little section out of Are You Ready to Be Lucky? Uh, writing Kalila was painful. It was a painful topic. And it was based on my life experience, although it was fictionalized. So Are You Ready to Be Lucky just felt like being free of that. And I just had fun with these wacky characters. I'd, I'd gone to uh, Spain for extended periods of time, a few times and discovered that 
Spain is full of not Spanish people, but Brits. And some of them are pretty wacky. And, and I just, uh, you ask where I get stories and ideas. I steal some from real life and then put it at the front of the book. This, this is not based on any real character. <laughs> and I'll just leave it at that. So in this instance, Rosalind has ended up moving in with this Brit in Spain. And she's, she just thought he was fabulous and you know, unique and interesting. And she's starting to recognize what he's really like. They're in this story, they're on their way to Scotland where he is an old aunt and um, they're driving in the car and Rosalind's driving. The first time Duncan asked her if she was feeling peckish, Rosalind thought he meant did she want sex. What a disappointment when he opened the freezer door and offered her a pop tart. They haven't spoken for going on two hours. Not since Rosalind mentioned over the drumming on the rent rental car roof that all this rain is like the monsoons of Africa she saw on the Discovery Channel. And Duncan said, it wasn't anything like Africa, nothing at all. Aren't you something? He nodded off in the passenger seat 15 minutes ago, head bobbing forward. All that strain to win the war of silence has tuckered him out. Rosin studies the back of Duncan's head. A smidgen too flat above the puffy gray hairs floofing out below the thinning. The overall effect, a bed skirt. But she's feeling magnanimous and perky here behind the wheel on the wrong side of the road. The British have so much to deal with. The price of petrol, bad teeth, fallings out as Duncan calls them. A two hour silence is nothing. Rosin glances at Duncan hung forward against his seatbelt as if on a county fair ride. As she slammed on the brakes, his forehead would smack the dash. She doubts this is the beginning of the silent years. Duncan has so much yet to say. Take yesterday evening during takeoff from the Alicante airport. Rosalind, digging in her purse for gum, came upon two Kit Kat bars. Rosalind, do you want a chocolate bar, Duncan? Duncan, staring at her offering. Do you have one? Rosalind, here. Duncan, that's not a chocolate bar. That's a biscuit. Rosalind, I don't care what it's called. Do you want one? By now, both pinned against their seats, harder to fight. Next kinked as the lumbering Ryanair dragged itself skyward. Duncan, fishing in his carry-on, pulled out two penguins he'd been saving since he picked them up at the British pantry in, in Calgary. Can't buy these things in Canada unless they're imported, he said for the umpteenth time, chuckling. The things that have to be imported in your country. Things nobody but Duncan would hanker after. Creme fresh, double cream, Mr. Kipling's cherry, well, cherry bakewell tarts. He undid the tiny tray attached to the seat in front, although the plane was still climbing blocked as they were from the sight line of the flight attendants buckled in front and back. He arranged the chocolate bars, his, hers, for her to inspect. Duncan, now you would call these chocolate bars, would you? Rosalyn, yes, Duncan, I would. Duncan, triumphantly, well, they're not, they're biscuits. Rosalyn, in England, it's a biscuit, Duncan. In Canada, it's a chocolate bar. Duncan. Chuckling, tucked the bars away, shaking his head. Wasn't she cute? Rosalind speeds up the windshield wipers and peers through the rain. How many years does she have left of Duncan's solicitous lectures? Don't people eventually get liver cancer drinking like he does? <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> We were all on mute, so you couldn't hear us laughing as you were reading. I feel like we have to add a laugh track to that. So. <laughs> it, was, it was fun to write, I have to say. Oh, hilarious. Rosemary Nixon, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Your most recent work of fiction, Are You Ready to Be Lucky, is available now, as are your other works. And we're so glad that you've joined us this, uh, this day. It was a delight for me to join you. Thank you so much for having me. 
Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.